Um, my name is Tim Wilson. I'm the editor of uh, Dark Reading. I'm here with uh, Michelle Schaefer. She's the vice president for the security practice at Merit Group. And um, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit today about how the news gets made in security and how that impacts your priorities, how it maps to your priorities as security professionals, and how, um, and it, basically to give you a real good solid grain of salt to take the news with uh, and to use when you talk to you know, CEOs and everybody who goes crazy when they see a story appear and they think that you should be doing something about it. Um, let me let me start by uh, I'll tell you a little bit about um, my background and I'll let Michelle tell you a little bit about what she does. Um, I'm the one of the founding editors of Dark Reading, which hopefully you guys know. Um, we are a, a news organization, part of the Information Week, uh, Information Week network. Um, so I work with a lot of other publications like Network Computing, and I've been in um, I've been a consultant, but I've been mostly a journalist for, for most of my career doing IT journalism. Um, Michelle, you want to talk a little bit about, just so they know who we are. Yes. So why are we here and why are we qualified to talk about this? Um, so I'm Michelle Schaefer. I'm the VP of the Security Practice at Merit Group. We're a boutique-sized PR firm down the street in Tyson's Corner. Um, I've been doing cybersecurity PR now for coming up on 11 years. and. I run a team of about six people, and every day we are working with cybersecurity clients to figure out what news is going to be big every day, what news our clients need to comment on, what stories they need to be part of, and what stories they don't need to be part of. And so the perspective that I bring today is just that I'm working with folks like Tim every day. I work with his staff on news stories that break, and the climate that we've seen um, just over the past, I don't know, two, three years is immense. We can't even figure out every day, given all the breaches, all the malware, everything that's in the news, what's important. And so that's our job as PR and media folks to figure out what are the big stories and what need to be covered. So we're going to talk a bit today about how that all comes together and how what you read is important to your day-to-day -day jobs. Um, and that's the big problem, isn't it, right now? I mean, you talk about... Um, we, we are dealing with, uh, when we started dark reading, I don't know, we, we might have had one really big breach story a, a week, something like that. Now it's more like two or three a day. I mean, it's JP Morgan, it's Target, it's, it's you know, Dairy Queen, it's, you know, whatever the breach is of the day. And then, of course, you know, some of you guys are security researchers, so you're, in, you know, sending me emails saying, you know, discovered this, or I'm getting a release from a, from a company saying they've discovered, you know, something new, a new SSL vulnerability, a new, and so my guess is that you're wrestling with a lot of the same problems I am, which is that we're being inundated now with news, with information about vulnerabilities, breaches, things that are happening, and it's, and the hard part is figuring out what are you going to do about it? And should, do you even need to do anything about it as in, in your organization? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, I, up here, I'm, I'm giving an example of, it, it's very interesting as, as a reporter to look at those, these things and see how they evolve sort of across the media. Now, Target, we talk about it all the time. Every presentation you see has Target in it. There's, it's, it's held up as an example of, things that can go wrong, that's a breach that everybody talks about. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the eBay breach, numbers-wise, the eBay breach was bigger. Adobe was, was bigger. Why, why aren't we talking about those things? Some of it has to do with the way they were attacked. Some of it has to do with um, the, um, how their critical it was um, interpreted as being. And some of it just has to do flat with the fact that some companies have better PR than others. And that's the part that I want to talk to you a little bit about, give you a little sort of backroom view of how the media works so that when people start bringing up to you that the New York Times covered this and you need to do something about it, you'll have some ammunition to say, well, you know, maybe the New York Times doesn't know as much as we do, or maybe the New York Times' audience is a little bit different than our, than our business. 
And so, you know, give you a sense for how to talk to your folks about, you know, all of this, all of these news stories. But interesting again to see, to see that, you know, some stories get a lot of coverage and some stories don't get nearly as much. So let's talk about a little bit, uh, a little bit about who cybersecurity journalists are. Um, a lot of us are reporters. We're, we grew up in the journalism space. I don't have a computer science background. I'm not, uh, I'm not a hacker. I've been at this for, I don't know, 20 years now. So I'm not stupid about it, but I'm, I'm not anywhere near what you guys are, you know, in terms of understanding the, the details, the technical details. But I do have access to a lot of people. I get, I get pitched from all over the place. I get uh, conversation from security researchers. I get vendors. I get, um, uh, you know, even the hackers themselves sometimes will, co will come to us because we're a big vehicle. We're, we're a place with that a lot of security professionals read and they want to reach that audience. So I get a lot of stuff. So most of these reporters are wrestling with, you know, how to, how to make, how to decide what they're going to write that day. We can't write everything. So how do they make the decision on what they're going to write about? Why is it that, that Target gets in the New York Times and, you know, some of these other breaches don't? You know, the fact is media is a business, right? It's driven by advertising. There's, there's, there's vendors behind it. There are analysts behind it. There are people who have a, a dog in the fight. Um, there are, uh, and there's a basic need for media to drive traffic. So the more times you click on my stories, the more, the better my, I look to my bosses. And so a lot of reporters will sensationalize the news. They'll make more out of it than that really is. They'll make a headline that, that's a lot sexier and you read and you realize when you read it, it's not that big a deal. So we're, on the one hand, we're a filter. We, we help a little bit, you know, with figuring out what's important and what isn't and what you might need to know more about and what you don't. But we're not entirely reliable for you and your organization. You have, you have special needs. You have, you have a particular set of things you need to worry about. So there's the disconnect. You know, you have, um, you know, Michelle and I were talking about uh, Ebola on the way over here. You know, and then there's the big discussion, you know, every Ebola's in the news, we're all worried about Ebola, and, and it's a story in, that everybody's telling because everybody wants to read about it. Is Ebola the biggest threat to us? Probably not, you know, for at, at least at this point, we're much more likely to be hit by the flu or something like that. But that's boring, right? If I write a story about the flu, nobody's going to read it. So same thing happens in security. It's fear sells. You're going to get stories that are people stirring up stuff. And quite honestly, a lot of us journalists, not smart enough to, to filter it the way we should. Um, I think at Dark Reading we do a little better than some. But, you know, it, it happens to all of us. We get led down the garden path. So, <clears throat> Be careful with what you're hearing, um, you know, and, and there's a difference in the way organizations approach this stuff. Some folks, um, I, I see folks here in the audience that if they said there's a vulnerability, I would say yes, okay, this, that's a story. If, you, if you're telling me that because I know those folks are reliable. Um, it, on, the other, on the other hand, I may get um, a researcher I've never heard of before and he says this is critical. You know, do, you know, I have to vet that with people I, I can rely on. I need to talk to people. I need to ask questions. Um, and some folks are really good at PR, and they're good at saying not very much. You look at the, the, that first slide that I threw up between Target, eBay, and Adobe. eBay and Adobe, they're technical companies. They, they get it. They understand maybe we shouldn't say too much. Let's not say too much, and maybe nobody will cover it too much. Um, Target, they don't know that much about technology. They don't know about security researchers and security media and that kind of stuff. They let a lot of stuff go that they probably shouldn't have. So that's one of the reasons we end up talking about it. So as a result, you end up with sort of a skewed view when, when you're looking at publications of what, you know, what's important and what isn't, particularly as you map it to your own priorities. 
So let's talk about why things get into the news and why they don't. Um, give you a little bit of a backroom view of you know, how reporters and media are affected by security news. And Michelle's probably in, a, in as good a position as anybody to do that, because that's her job, is to influence us. <laughs> <laughs> At least I try to. Um, so yeah, so it's important, I think, again, putting it in perspective of the climate that we're dealing with today with you know, tons of malware, tons of breaches to figure out, you know, kind of what's real and what's not and what's worth talking to journalists about. Um, as a PR professional, you know, every single time I write a pitch, every time I pick up the phone and talk to a reporter, I'm not only putting my name on the line, I'm putting Merit Group, my company, their name on the line, and the clients that I represent. So what I'm coming to them with has to be good, it has to be accurate, it has to be correct, and it has to be big enough that they're gonna care about um, what I'm saying. Because I understand reporters, and I understand what they're dealing with. I mean, the folks like Tim that I'm talking to every day, they're inundated. They get 300 pitches a day from PR professionals like myself and other folks telling them, you know, this is the big news, you gotta cover it today, Tim. Today's your day, write the story. But he doesn't have time, and his staff don't have time. They've got to figure out what's big, what's not, what's accurate, what's inaccurate. And they just don't have a lot of time on their hands to even think through, I think, some of the pitches that they're getting. It's just, it's, I mean, I feel bad, honestly, for a lot of the journalists I'm working for right now that um, are working with that are kind of struggling to figure it out. In fact, I had a reporter call me two weekends ago. I'm outside with my kiddo. He's making me take pictures of his new fancy shoes. And a reporter um, from Reuters calls me and he's like, Michelle, I need help. I've got to vet something. Another story related to the JP Morgan um, breach is out and I'm just not sure. You know, the New York Times wrote about it yesterday and I'm looking at it and I'm hearing from my sources. Michelle, I don't think this is a real legit story. Can you call a few folks and help me vet the story? So what do I do? Stop taking pictures of the shoes. Tell my son, sorry, mommy's got to work for 10 minutes. Make a few phone calls and I call him back. I'm like, Today is not the day to write the story. Hold off on that. And he listened to me. And I think it's because I've worked with this guy for a number of years that he trusts what I said. And I said, let's watch this play out. Watch the news. Watch how it trickles out the next few days. And then if you want to go and write the story, call me back and I'll help you get connected. So there's an instance of a top reporter, top of the field, unsure because he's getting, you know, everybody chirping in his ear about you know, how big this new story could come out and how big it'll be. But you know what's more, most important to that journalist? Accurate reporting. And I think that is something that I feel some reporters, media, journalists, whoever it is, they might be sacrificing accurate reporting right now for the clicks, the hits, the, you know, top story of the day. And it's, it's definitely disconcerting being, um, I think, in our fields right now, kind of knowing what's real, what's not. But yeah, so reporters are on deadline. I get them all the time contacting my team. Hey, Michelle, I need three or four comments for a story. I got a file before noon. Get me the comments and I'll get your clients into the story. So I call it people like Rick Gordon sitting over there um, and Bob Stratton, who they're my client right now. I work with Mach 37 and I'm like, hey, do you guys have anything to say about this breach or this news? And sure as day, they usually send me something back and I send it to the reporter and there it is. There's the story. And then they're on to the next story. So, you know, it's my job is to help them get connected with sources, with people that are trusted, that they know that they're going to get accurate information from. And what reporters love? Well, they love news that's compromises, you know, big um, stories that are going to affect their readership, that their readers are going to want to see. They love talking about breaches, as we all know. Um, and then fear, fear mongering. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges um, you know, I have every day is I see these stories and I don't want to be an ambulance chaser. I don't want to put my clients out there commenting every day on every breach because you know what? At some point, these journalists are going to say, Michelle, no, no, no more. They're going to put me in their spam filter and I won't get my emails through to them. So that's why it's so important, I think, to really vet the stories, to vet it through sources and really come to the journalists with accuracies. Um, what journalists don't love is breaches with very little impact. Um, they're obviously looking for the big story. And then deep technical breach stories, 
and companies that no one knows. Um, so it's tough if you're representing a brand new startup to go out and say, all right, we found this great vulnerability, this, you know, we've got this new research. To get through it takes a lot, to get through all the other news cycles that the reporters are dealing with, so that's important. But I think the key takeaway is what you see in the news um, often is what's easiest to write. I think the journalists are trying to crank the stories, get their three or four stories done, file before the deadline, and move on to the next thing. And again, they're oftentimes not taking enough time to really vet, vet the stories as much as they should. So who influences the news? Um, obviously vendors. I represent quite a bit of security vendors. Um, you know, companies that have anti-malware solutions, um, firewalls and the like, all kinds of technology solutions. Um, and then, you know, the PR folks that represent the vendors. So we definitely play a part um, in influencing what these reporters are gonna write. But I think one of the key things that journalists know when they contact a PR person like myself is that they can get a hold of trusted sources. People that have been around in the industry a long time, people that have built a brand for themselves um, that they know are gonna give them, you know, a good quote for a story or give them a good interview and give them some backdrop of information. Um, reporters are also influenced by Twitter and social networks. Uh, as you guys know, anything that hits Twitter, it's, you know, this trickle down effect. So Brian Krebs writes a story, you know, he posts it on his Facebook, his Twitter, he gets it on Krebs on security, and literally it's this massive, you know, wave effect. Everybody's got to write about whatever Krebs broke. And in the case of Target, we saw, you know, many, many waves and still today of news cycles there. Um, Buzz is often what starts the story wave, so, you know, if Krebs tweets it, it gets a thousand retweets, a million retweets, so again, that helps influence it. And then influential tweeters carry more weight, so somebody like Jack Daniel, he tweets something, people listen. He carries a lot of weight in the security industry and people respect him. Um, so yeah, other media, so New York Times has broken a lot of news, as you can see. Um, and other journalists, other trade publications, other business press, other broadcast, the New York Times writes it, it's almost like their arms are twisted. They have to write it too. Um, and we've definitely seen that in the case of, um, you know, a lot of the big news that's hit over the past year to two years. In fact, it was Nicole Perlroth at the New York Times that broke the APT1 story for Mandiant. And um, I worked with something similar uh, with that particular journalist for CrowdStrike this year when we did the Putter Panda report. Because we knew if Nicole wrote it, everybody else might follow in step. So that's a case of what we call an exclusive in the PR world, where you give a story to a reporter that you trust and they hold it, and then it all breaks at one time. Search engines, they definitely play a role in influencing the news as well. Um, Google and Google News, huge drivers of traffic. And then, obviously, publications are using SEO. Um, for every story that's up there, they are search engine optimized to hit the top of the, tar the charts. So reporters are influenced by the same, same stuff that you are, what's on Twitter, what's on the web, and what people are talking about. So yeah, why are some stories so big and so out of control in, in each and every headline that you're reading? Well, big numbers. Anytime a breach like Target or Home Depot or J.P. Morgan's out there that affects 50 million people, you're going to see it all over because that's huge. That's a consumer-ish story, especially, you know, all of these places that we deal with. I shop at Home Depot. I shop at Target. As a consumer, I can't go into either of those stores right now and feel good about swiping my credit card. No, you can't either. So um, big numbers play a big role. Big names, breaches at well-known companies. And then, of course, breaches that are flagged by respected authorities. You know, when Apple, Microsoft, the FBI comes out with a story, of course it gets huge readership. And then big claims. So there's a lot of stories that I see, you know, about first-of-its-kind malware. You know, first mobile malware to hit um, your Android device. All of that, again, it's how you spin the story. It's how you pitch it. Um, the PR people behind the scene know what kind of subject lines to put in the emails to grab a reporter's attention. Um, you know, if you play it up, they'll pay attention. They won't throw that email into the trash folder. 
And then unusual threat actors. So obviously there's a ton in the news about corporate espionage, um, you know, China, Russia, everybody's pointing fingers about, um, you know, where a lot of the um, information is being stolen from US companies. So those seem to be carrying a lot of weight lately. And I think, again, it was kind of a trickle down from APT1 to today. Um, politically motiv motivated attacks, of course, the Syrian electronic army was in the news, uh, you know, quite a bit a while back, and then anonymous, of course, and then highly sophisticated attacks. So Stuxnet um, and stories like that definitely get big and they get a ton of coverage. And then the key takeaway here is that reporters build on stories that lots of readers can relate to and stories that have already gotten a lot of attention. So, you know, again, New York Times breaks a story, then the Washington Post writes about it, then Dark Reading writes about it, and E-Week, and it's, you know, 200 stories within three or four hours on the same exact piece of news. Okay. Can you jump in here with me? Yeah. So, why is Target, you know, why does, it, why does it keep coming up over and over again? You know, the, you know a lot of it has to do with the way we, we converse. We don't have a really good security community for the good guys right now. The bad guys have an IRC, they have you know, lots, of, lots of good conversation. We're, we're kind of stuck with LinkedIn, we've got you know, things, we've got Twitter, we've got ways of, of, of communicating that are sort of faulty. Um, we're working on some stuff at Dark Reading, we hope that will help with, with some of that. But I mean, the, the bottom line is we're sort of an echo chamber sometimes, right? You know, we're talking to each other. We're saying, you know, this is important and, and, and we end up repeating the same things over and over again rather than sort of moving on. So, you know, you, you get the, these um, conversations that make things seem bigger than they are because everybody's talking about it or somebody came in late and they, you know, it's sort of like when you're in a business meeting and uh, you know, people come in late and, and you end up talking about what you started talking about at the beginning of the meeting all over again. And it, rather than moving on, we're not, we're not always seeing what's important. And we're affected by the, the numbers. You know, it's like, well, um, you know, somehow Target's more important because the numbers are bigger. You know, some, you know the, 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 the name of the company was big. The, the, the number of people who were affected was big. But, you know, if you're in an organization and you're a victim of a targeted attack, you know, there may have been only a few instances of that particular attack. That may not be news to me, but it sure as hell is important to you. And so the, 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 you begin to separate, you know, what's important to you versus what's important to the media. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that we're trying to get at, at here. Um, you know, reporters are affected by, um, a lot of things, the, the, the people that they trust. You know, they have, they talk to the same people over and over again because they're accessible and they're smart. And so you end up getting, again, you know, sort of an echo chamber because you're having the same conversation with the same person, maybe too frequently. Um, reporters are looking for clicks. They're looking for, you know, a lot of people to click on the story. So they're, they're easily drawn to a story that they know did well for them the last time. So it's sort of like movies and sequels. You know, it's like, well, it did well the last time. I'll do, I'll do another story on that rather than moving on. So um, they're, sometimes they're missing, you know, things that are, again, targeted attacks, sophisticated attacks that maybe only a few people have seen. Um, the, the vulnerabilities that uh, a security researcher um, may have, um, uncovered but doesn't really know how to get it out there. Um, you know, some security researchers are better at that than others. So you, you, what you find is that you're, you've left some stories behind. My, you know, I have a staff of, you know, three, four writers and we publish, I don't know, you know, four or five stories, new stories a day. And I guess that we're probably one of the most prolific cybersecurity publications that there is, and yet I'm leaving news on the table every day. Every day there's a story that I should have, I feel like I should have written about that didn't make it for one reason or another. And these are things that, you know, uh, that we try to do our best with links and, 
and blogs and whatever we can do to let you know about this stuff, but you may not be seeing all of the stuff that you need to know about you know, in your particular environment. So let's talk um, briefly about how you get your information. You know, um, you, know you, you have lots of, of stuff available to you. You have Twitter, you have what you see in social media. Um, Coworkers and colleagues, you know, I mean, what, we've, what, I've, what research I've done, and tell me if, you, if I'm wrong, but a lot of folks uh, tell us that they get their best information from people that they know, people that they trust, that are colleagues, it, maybe in other organizations, uh, maybe if you're in a big company, maybe you have lot, several security people in your organization and you're sharing information. That's where a lot of folks get their most reliable information. Now, you've got a lot, you've got a lot of, of sources of information that are not so good, like top executives, you know, who've read something in the New York Times. Um, you know, New York Times, you know, not, you know, has a lot of influence, not the best reporters, not the most security savvy reporters all the time. Sometimes, because they don't eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff. They're writing business stuff, they're writing a lot of other stuff. They're, they don't kind of, they're not in the, as deep into it as some of the others. So. Um, there, that's that's an issue. Sometimes you get warnings from vendors, or or you know, you get patch warnings. You get service providers saying, you know, hey, watch out for that. So that's another thing that I might not see, the, but you you're seeing on a regular basis. Um, you've got the you've got CERT. You've got the the, uh, the various CVS you know reporting me methods there are for vulnerabilities. Um, you're you've got you know data coming that may just pop up on Facebook or Google or, or that kind of thing. Um, you may follow bloggers, you may follow so, you know, particular security researchers or, or Brian Krebs or whoever you like. Um, and then you've got you know, the kind of the general, the general press and then you got trade press like, like us. So you've got a lot of influences that you're dealing with and um, you're, that you're trying to filter. Now, how do you prioritize your response to all this information. That's the trick, right? It's, okay, now I know about, as much as I can know about today, um, as far as what the, what the threats are, now how do I prioritize my response? This is where I feel for you guys, because you've got so many influences that may change your priorities, not necessarily in a good way. I mean, if you have, if the CEO says, this is important and you need to do something about it, you may have to drop stuff that you know is more important, but you have to respond in some way because you've been asked to. Um, you, um, you have vendors who will tell you that something is critical. You know, it may not be for your environment, but they'll tell you it's critical. You feel like I better get that patch in, you know, because I'm being told that that's, you, um, you've got compliance. Compliance is, is a huge issue for a lot of you. Um, and if you're, if you're in a threat, in, in threat of being out of compliance, you may have to respond to that very quickly, even though security-wise it's not the most important thing for you. Um, you have industry mandates, you've got CERT and, and other folks who prioritize the, the criticality of the vulnerability on a, a scale that's meant for everybody, but it doesn't necessarily work for your organization. You may not have those particular systems or those particular, you may not have important data on those particular systems. Their view of what's critical may not be your view. So you've got um, system mandates, you've got um, you know, just automated responses saying it's time to patch this. And then you've got news, like you know, the stuff that we've been talking about. So you've got a lot of different uh, ways that you're being asked to prioritize you, what you're going to do that day, and what fires you're going to fight first, um, and it's 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 really really hard on on you. I know I I feel feel for you a lot of times. So, you know, at the top level, I mean, I think, and and way in if you you know the, the the media by and large is is not a great bellwether for you know what what your priorities should be that day. You, you, it's part of a bigger picture. 
but you need to filter it in a way that, that suits your environment. The same, same you would for threat intelligence. You get threat intelligence data, you get a feed of data from all over the place. Some of that stuff just doesn't matter to you. So, you know, treat the media that same way. And your top executives don't know the media either. They don't understand some of the things that we're telling you right here. They don't understand that some of these media are being affected by vendors, they're being affected by the people that they know, they're being affected by um, just the desire to get lots and lots of clicks on their stories. That's, you know, these are things that you should push back with when your CEO says, we need to do something about this. Give them six reasons why, maybe not. Maybe this is not, you know, maybe it's, it's somewhere in the priority list, but it's not at the top. Um, you, need to, you need to be able to filter the news, you know, based on what your particular um, requirements are. And, and uh, you know, I mean, I think f for you, with the, with, you see this in working with clients, you know, some of, some of them care about some stuff and some of them don't. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, don't believe the hype all the time. I know that's a silly phrase, but, you know, things do get overhyped a lot. And if you think about when certain news breaks and the timing of it, um, you know, it's my job to talk to clients all the time about if they've got big news, when to release it, when is it going to make those headlines. And you know, think about the timing of APT1. It was a couple weeks before RSA. And you, they walked into RSA and Kevin Mandia, God love him, had like a trail of people following him all over. Um, you know, it was smart. It was a way to build up the hype about Mandia going into a major security trade show. Um, a lot of that happens before Black Hat. So you see, you know, research starting to trickle out um, from the, you know, folks that are gonna be presenting at the shows. There's like big stories. I mean, Dark Reading writes 40 stories on all the great research that's gonna come out of a show like that. Um, you know, you just have to think about kind of what's surrounding news and what maybe the ulterior motives are for the vendors or whoever's releasing it. Again, people wanna get big headlines. They wanna be, you know, on the cover of the New York Times. They wanna be in the Wall Street Journal and they wanna be in Dark Reading. So. Timing is everything, I think, in the world of news, and a lot of these companies work with PR folks like myself that you know, can counsel them on that. But it is important, you know, again, a lot of what you see in the news may not even be applicable to what you're dealing with every day when you're sitting there dealing with threats coming in from a SOC or what have you. So again, I guess just, you know, not take it with a grain of salt. I'm sure some of um, the news that you do read is important, uh, certainly patches, vulnerabilities, things that you've got to deal with, but keep in mind, I think that vendors do have their own agenda um, when it comes to news. I think the, the timing of things, too, is, is, it's ironic, but we know a lot more about breaches that happened, say, a year ago than we know about the one that happened last week. If you look at the, the stories that we're writing, on any given um, breach, so many of them are, are so similar. You know, it's like the vendor says, or the, uh, the victim says, I have, um, you know, we're reporting a breach. We, it may have affected, you know, all of the credit card customers we have. We don't think any data has been stolen. We don't really know how, it's, how the breach took place, or we're not telling you because it's under investigation. If you read these stories, they're very similar, you know, the day that they come out. What we know more about are the stories that have been out for a while, because sometimes, you know, we can get access to people who will actually tell us, you know, this is what happened, this is what the breach, you know, this is what the breach looked like. We have uh, sources like, who actually did investigations, like Mandiant or Verizon Business, or, you know, these folks who actually spent some time, you know, doing the investigation and can tell us, what happened, and you can learn more about something about an old breach than a lot of times you can learn about that breach. You know, I, you get to that point where you have to know certain things in order to sit at the water cooler. You know, you, you, you have to know that JP Morgan was attacked this week or that kind of thing. And I, I get that, but you know, in terms of understanding uh, how it can help you, how, how you can learn a lesson from it, you know, go back and look at some of the older breaches and some of the in-depth coverage, and, and you'll learn a lot more. Yeah, I think it's funny that just this past week, the whole 
Um, SSL vulnerability, you know, everybody thought the web was gonna come crashing to a halt. Um, I had a reporter tell me on Wednesday that he couldn't cover my news that I had for one of my clients because he was waiting for that big SSL story to break. I'm like, okay, I get it. Yeah, I get that news might be bigger. But when it broke, yeah, what did they say? Heartbleed was bigger, Bash was bigger. It wasn't that big of a deal. But whoever was feeding him in the background all this information about this SSL vulnerability made him believe that was the story to cover. Nothing else really mattered. And he was waiting around for that to break, to put his big news piece out. So again, it, it's, it's an interesting time, I think, to be in PR and media because, you know, it's like fighting fires right now. Like, what's real? What's not? What's overhyped? Um, yeah, so. So, um, some thoughts, and Michelle's going to tell you a little bit in, in a slide about um, what, what to do when you're, if it's you that's breached. Um, but, you know, I, I think at, at the, this top level, I think we've kind of beaten this one, you know, don't let the media set your agenda. Use it as a tool, just like you would a threat intelligence service or whatever, but, you know, don't, don't you know, be sure and push back if you see, you know, something in the news that you feel like doesn't affect you, you but you're probably right. Um, there are waves of, of uh, news, just like, um, product announcements, you know, you kind of see, see it hit its peak and then nobody talks about it. Um, you know, those are the times when you may have the reverse problem where you're, you have trouble getting budget to stop a, a threat, but it hasn't been in the news in a while, so nobody's thinking about it, so they think, well, why do you need money for that? Um, that's, that's the sort of the opposite problem where, where because it's not in the news anymore, but you're still trying to fix it, um, you you have you know you need to go back and, and look at at the 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 evaluations of the criticality the 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 issues that are involved and how to fix it um, and those kinds of things and bring those you may have to bring up a story that was written a year ago be, in order to, to get the budget that you need to fix the problem that you you've known has been there um, and as you read it you know. Um, you know, look look at yourself. I you know I say read the news like a financial analyst. You know, a financial analyst doesn't necessarily make investments on on headlines. They they have a certain strategy that they've been following all along. They know when certain things hit them that that's big to them. It may not be big news, but you know, so that page four story suddenly becomes the one that they use to to make that big to trigger that big investment. That may be your case as well. Um, it, may be, it may be a lesser announcement. It may be something that you found somewhere buried um, that may be the one thing that your particular organization needs to worry about. And, and you know, recognize that you know, your decisions aren't going to be the same as some of your colleagues, particularly if they're in other industries. You, know, you, you may have a, a different set of priorities than uh, it depends on where your data lies, what, what are your key applications, and that sort of thing. So, you know, it, it, how the news affects you depends, you know, largely on who you are. So, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, what if it's you? What if you're the one who's in the, in the news, and what do you do about that? So, I presented about, I guess, a year and a half ago at a Northern Virginia Technology Council panel on you know, data breaches and having a data breach response plan in place. And I'd venture to say that a lot of companies now probably have something in the works. Two, three years ago, definitely not, um, unless you're a major corporation, a huge enterprise. Um, I think Target, if there's one thing that maybe is good that's come out of these major breaches with Home Depot and Target is that Crisis communications teams, corporate communications teams have sat down with legal, they've sat down with the executives and they figured out, okay, what if it happens to me? What are we gonna actually do? Um, and part of it is understanding how the media is gonna respond. You know, if it's your company and you know, your breach makes the news and it's covered all over, um, you need to know that it's gonna happen quick um, once one story leaks, many, many others come quickly right after. Um, you need to know what you have to disclose and what you don't. Um, in terms of authorities, um, you know, maybe you don't need to 
disclose every single detail if a reporter calls you. In fact, you know, in the presentation I gave, I said the first step really is to come up with a statement. Because when you've been breached in those critical moments, you don't have all the details to give. You have to figure out with your IT security staff, you know, and many forensics folks, and it may take months and months to figure out how it happened, how they got in. So coming up with a quick, short statement that's going to at least be a response for the media to let them know, hey, we're not ignoring you, we understand, you want to know details, but we don't have them right now, is okay. So maybe even keeping it less detailed because you don't have that to give is okay. And then be accurate very accurate. That is one of the most critical things because if you are dishonest, um, whether it's your PR folks that make the statement, your executive, that's the worst thing you could possibly do if you've been breached. You know, honesty is everything. Um, and then when it is possible, turn it into a lesson learned. Put a positive spin on it. What did we take away from all of this? Um, and how can other organizations learn from our mistakes? So you'll see that Target and other companies that have been breached um, over the years, eventually, not immediately, but six, eight months, a year down the line, some of their executives will be comfortable with talking about those lessons learned and what the key takeaways are. So coming up with a way to put a positive spin on something pretty negative is, uh, is good, but it takes time. It definitely does. Um, and then recognizing all the aspects of the impact. So you have to think about all your um, folks that are going to be affected by a data breach. So first and foremost, you know, your customers. You have to think about getting a message to customers, um, making sure that, you know, your brand is already going to be fairly damaged, but you want to minimize that, but making sure your customers don't lose trust. And I would say one company that did a particularly good job, and Tim, you probably remember this, um, a security company actually that got breached about two years ago was Bit9. And it was, I can't remember the, all the details of why they got breached, but I remember specifically them using their blog as a great communications tool. So as more details were uncovered about how they were breached, they were posting, I think, at least one blog every other day because it was their way to say, you know what, we made a mistake, we have been breached, but we want to communicate. We don't want to leave our customers, you know, our investors, our board, our, you know, all these folks that trust this company in the gray. We want to give them information as we have it. And so thinking about how to communicate that message um, and how to work with you know, your PR folks, your legal folks, how to convey that message and in what venue you're going to do it is really important. But yeah, you have to think about all of the trickle down effects, you know, the impact, the brand damage, the la loss of trust, and then loss of credibility. Um, and you really do have to do, you know, crisis response, um, you know, exercises. So I recommend this all the time to companies. Do, you know, fake scenarios, do mock scenarios and sit down in a boardroom with all of your executives and play out this real life, you know, breach incident and how you're each going to respond. I mean, it's very important to do that kind of an exercise um, with your company to figure out how you're gonna handle it when the time does come. I saw you raise your hand back there. combination of, of things. I, I think um, that, quite honestly, they gave fewer details. Um, and, you know, I, and this is working against my, my best interest. But you know what? You're better off not giving out a whole lot of details. As soon as we found out that Target got breached through an HVAC um, company, you know, it, it brought up a whole new set of discussions and that kind of thing. I also think that there's a little bit of um, sort of wearing down of the public. You know, if you think about consumers, um, the, you know, they had already seen Target and Neiman Marcus and Dairy Queen and, you know, I mean, just retailer after retailer. So I think by the time Home Depot hit, you know, they were sort of 
you know, inured to it a little bit. Sorry. Yes. And the fact that they lost their CIO and their CEO as a result, um, I think that kind of thing, you know, tells you, you know, it, this is bad news. And and when your CEO steps down because of the breach, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, that becomes a lot bigger deal. You know, um, you know, you could have argued that maybe that shouldn't have happened. Um, they they obviously felt like because of the shareholders that they needed to do that. A lot of companies have been through worse breaches and did, didn't lose people as a result. That's, the, that's what, one of the things I was thinking about as she was talking about that is the, is the difference in the audience, right? If you're bit nine, you better sure as hell <laughs> tell security professionals what they need to know because that's the audience that you have to answer to. Now, if you're target, you don't have to worry about that as much, right? Because it's not, it's not gonna, your, security's not your business, right? So you're better off, you're dealing with mainstream media who know nothing about this stuff. And so you're better off kind of fudging and, you know, maybe, you know, it's, it's only publications like, like us or super reporters like Krebs, who, you know, really know their stuff, that can really ask the right questions, that really dig up the stuff. So, you know, sometimes that's, it depends on who your audience is. Go ahead. Uh, one, one, one more question about uh, the Bit9 thing. Bit9's response was, we got breached because we weren't running our product on the server that was compromised. That's what their story was. Is that how do you, is that against them? So I think it was admitting fault. I mean, and it's hard for a security company to do that. That's, you know, product is being used by how many different companies. That's a hard thing to mask. And honestly, you know, I know the girl that worked did the PR when that breach happened. And I mean, it was a difficult couple weeks to figure all that out. But you know, it's almost like, okay, you gotta come clean or cleaner as a security company when you're going out and telling the world, use my product, I will secure you. So, you know, RSA, Bit9, Barracuda, you know, security companies do get breached and it, honestly admitting fault is a hard thing to do, but, you know, again, being honest is critical. Now, when you are a Target or a Home Depot, Probably easier to shield some of those details. Yeah. Go ahead. I think um, you guys alluded to you know all these breaches are to some extent causing some fatigue in the public. Do you think businesses are going to start getting fatigued in, in investing in security personnel or response or whatnot? Because you know, Steve, you know I, I went to the presentation on a similar topic at B Size Vegas and. You know, in the long term, there doesn't really seem to be any brand damage or any stock hits or things like that. And ironically, if the financials are technically healthy, it's a good buy to buy stock in a breach company the day it gets breached or the day after because you know in the long term it's going to bounce back and you're going to make money off it. So our business is going to kind of say, you know what, it's not worth investing in a lot of these security or PR things because we'll just hand out some security monitoring you know, we'll give, we'll pay whatever we need to pay kind of, you know, to, you know, as insurance, but people are going to still go to Target because it might be the shop that's down the road from them or Walmart. Do you think they're going to start getting fatigued and kind of maybe, you know, the message that we're sending, they're going to start getting tuned out to it? Um, I'll go you one better. I, I think there's a lot of companies that don't disclose their breaches at all, law or new law. I think there's a lot of companies that make a business decision that the cost of being found out and the, and the fines that they might pay are less than if they actually disclosed it. Um, and I think I think that's I think there's I think yes I think there's definitely a, a question of you know do I disclose the breach and how do I disclose it um, and you know whether or not um, it's going to have an impact on my, um, uh, 
on my job as the CSO or my job as the CIO or, or that kind of thing, you know, you know, it, it hasn't in a lot of cases. Now, Target is, an, is a, probably an exception, but it, you know, in that case, it certainly did. It caused brand damage, it caused uh, stock damage, it caused CIOs and CEOs to lose their jobs, and I think that's the, the worst case scenario. But there's lots of folks who, it's, it's risk, right? You just, you're making a value judgment based on what you think the risk is. And I think a lot of companies are actually deciding, you know, even though every state has disclosure mandates and, and there's a, there are serious penalties, if you're found out later that you didn't disclose it, you were supposed to. I, I, but I do think that there are companies that, that make those decisions based on, on what they think the business risk is. So, uh, shifting uh, a couple of questions. One, so the latest the trend is your reaches. How long do you think that's going to last before that actually is just the entire reporting if all reaches get shuffled to page 10 unless it's, you know, multi-million, you, know, you know, unless you get like a billion and a half you know, reach. Um, you know, I mean, most of the time, most of the, I, I know for myself, it's like reach, I didn't reach in the news and go, whatever. I don't even pay attention. I assume I'm part of it. So, you know, or my friends are part of it. Who cares? Um, I'll wait uh, six months when the lessons learned to come out and maybe read that. But how long do you think right for the public themselves be tired of it? I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. You know, one, one is there's, there's, there are more breaches now than we can cover. Right? I got. I mean, I have one of the better, one of the larger staffs of all the security publications. I can't cover them all. So we're in the process of building out a section of the site that's just going to be sort of a, an analogy to databreaches.org. You know, where you know you'll get information about breaches, but if we don't have real good data, then you know, for me to spend for me to send a reporter to write about it all day. You know, this is not a good use of the resources I've got. So, you know, news-wise, I think we're, we've reached a point at already where there's, there's more news than we can cover, and there's less interest in reading it than there, than there was. Now, having said that, I, I think the lessons learned piece for you guys is essential. You know, we have to... We as reporters, that's that's our job. We have to find out what happened and how it matters to you. Um, and so, um, if what I'm going to have to start doing is say, no matter how big the breach is, if we don't have information on what the how it happened and what you could potentially learn from it, if it doesn't have any value for you as security professionals, then I'm not going to devote a, a reporter to that story. Um, but if, you know, um, if, if we continually, I mean, you guys deal with this every day, right? You can't push fear as a means to get the budget that you need or to get the, the, the data or to get the, the backing that you need from top executives. You have to be really careful because otherwise you lose all your credibility, right? So we're, we're in that same position. You know, we, if, we, if we report like a knee jerk, Every breach that we hear about, then you guys aren't even going to read us anymore. So that's the, you know, the balance that we're, you know, can we learn something from this? Can we really get some value from, you know, a mistake that was made, um, or are we just, you know, adding to the to the pile? Um, I think we really need to start thinking about that. Okay, we're just about out of time. Can we talk a little bit? You said you know your role as a journalist, find out what happened and and how it matters. Can you talk a little bit about educating your readers? Because that Apple story that came out about a month ago was Apple hacked, sexy pictures, sexy naked pictures, right? Great headline, lots of clicks. But in reality, the headline was really more security questions are not secure, and use two factor off. And you didn't see a whole lot about that in the report. Yeah, and that's and see that's that's where we try to. You know, we're, for for us to start reading, we have to separate ourselves from that. You know, the mainstream press, you know, you couldn't look at that story and you know they would have a deal with Jennifer Lawrence naked pictures and, and that sort of thing. 
we have to consciously set that aside, and I think we did in that, in that case, um, and try to pr produce a story that actually is useful to you. That, you know, what, what exactly was it that happened? You know people are talking about it, but what can you add to that conversation? And I think that's what you're looking for. You know, whether it's from us or someplace else, you want data or a story or something where you can say, okay, let, let's add, let me add some value to, to this conversation instead of just talking about what happened. You know, this is what we should do about it, you know, that kind of thing. And that's, it, it's hard to find that information. I think, I'm with you. Well, what's funny about that story is that um, it broke either like a Saturday night late or like Sunday morning and one of my clients got an inbound request from us weekly I'm like and I was shocked that they took the interview but you know again very big story um, the us weekly thing led to other broadcasts that they did later on that week um, it's celebrities so it was mainstream and everybody read about it yeah I mean it's, it's a sexy story I mean I think we're out of time we're getting kicked out <laughs> Thank Thanks, everybody. Coming. Let us know if you have any questions.